Welcome to today's edition where we'll be talking about JS8 Call, the hot new digital mode using a Microbitix HF radio and a Raspberry Pi. This is my new little portable setup. I kind of went all out. I've been itching to get one of these for years, um, away from having just a mobile in my truck or a base station in my house. I wanted something I can go out into the field with. And so I have a 21 watt solar panel connected to a 12 volt sealed lead acid battery that has the hardened power systems bat pack on the top of it with a built-in solar charger. From there, it provides power both to the Microbitix HF radio and there is a gray little contraption here that hardened power system makes. It is a three amp 12 volt to five volt converter that powers the Raspberry Pi, which you can't see here, but it's in the back of that seven inch touch screen. Why did I go with this? Just because I wanted to, to see how it would work. Um, in the end, I'm probably gonna recommend just getting a laptop or just having a Raspberry Pi where you can then use a VNC viewer from let's say a, a smartphone screen to, to do that with. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. And then from the Raspberry Pi connect to the signal link where I had a custom made cable that I made to connect into the Microbitix radio. Aside from that setup that you just saw, which is now located on the right side of this picture, you need an antenna. So for my truck, I always have this tiny Tar Heel 2 antenna, vertical antenna, and I wanted now to test a dipole antenna. In this case, I have the Wind Camp Gypsy dipole. What's really nice about this is it's a very small form factor, both when you fold it up, put it into your backpack, and when you set it up. And the center is a one-to-one -one ballon, and then it comes with some very nice uh, aluminum um, sections that you can wrap the wire on. And the wire itself has little shrink wrap color-coded uh, about one-inch sections throughout the length of the wire that lets you know which band you need to roll the wire out to. And then I have rope attached to two ends. Not ideal. I live in a community that you cannot install um, antennas like these without folks really getting into your business. So I just wanted to set this up temporarily and it's only six feet off the ground. This is by no means ideal, but I want to show you the true power of JS8 call as a digital mode and the fact that that Microbitix radio only outputs anywhere between seven or 10 watts. So in a couple slides, I'm going to show you just how far I was able to communicate with just this setup. Now the actual antenna, just so I can make sure I point this out to you, it's just right there in the center. You have two ends of the dipole, the ballon right there in the center, and then you see the coax going right down to the ground there. Because the Microbitix does not have a built-in SWR meter, I bought this little contraption off to the left. Um, MFJ makes some great HF SWR analyzers but I decided to go with this fully digital one from, there's a couple different Chinese manufacturers that make them. It's about $80, it does one to 60 megahertz. Not only shows you the SWR, but also shows you the impedance. And in fact, you can actually click the up or down button and you can get the complex impedance to find out either your inductance or your capacitance. So that is very handy. Now it does not have a built-in battery, <laughs> but what's nice is, is that the plug type for the Microbitix is the same for this, so I can just disconnect the plug off of the back end of the Microbitix radio, plug it into this, get the reading I need to make sure that I am definitely below a 2 to 1 SWR, and then connect it into the radio. Here I was able to get about 1.28 to 1 at 14.1 megahertz. Off to your right though, you see the Microbitix I did jazz this one up. It is a radio to which to each his own, however they want to make it. I did buy a case from uh, an, another Indian amateur radio operator that's been selling these for the Microbitics, which has been very handy. Had to 
solder everything together around the main microbitics board. But then I saw that Dr. Ian Lee, KD8CEC, came up with just an amazing uh, replacement to the uh, previous screen that they had and use a Nextian 2.4 inch color screen, touch screen, in fact. And so I loaded that up with uh, the firmware version 1.1. And as you can see there, I can have two different VFOs. Can switch between the two frequencies. Right now the main frequency is set to 14.078, which for 20 meters is the main frequency that JS Aders will use. And then you can also click on just above the 8, you see upper sideband, USB. You can switch between that, lower sideband, CW. So just fantastic. What I did here was, uh, kind of like the, the Harris PRC-150, you can detach the front faceplate. It's called a KDU. So I kind of mimicked that here. So the screen actually comes off. And how I accomplished this is, is the screws that you see that hold the uh, plastic protector around the screen actually uh, connect up to the magnets that you see uh, there on the four corners and so I can just detach it and if I wanted to I could make a longer set of wires for the screen um, though I have to be more concerned about the amount of resistance that's going to place on the um, power power lines and also the, the serial lines too connecting into the Arduino Nano that you see there peeking out uh, in that, that rectangular hole but it, it, it's just very neat because then I could take the screen off, put it on top of the radio, depending on how I want to position it for where I am, and then I can just adjust the frequency right from the screen. In fact, you see the mm -hmm. frequency there in particular is 14.074. That's the center frequency for actual FT8 um, mo digital mode. So on the seven inch touch screen that's connected to the Raspberry Pi, I have JS8 call uh, installed. I think we're already now to version 8.3 and that will change again here in about another week. Uh, but this, this is the version that's made for Raspbian, which is the operating system that runs on the Raspberry Pi. So I have just completed a QSO with K2MO Who's Tony all the way out there in Long Island talking to me, KF4WZB in Kansas? That's over a thousand miles away. So he has responded that he observed me at negative 18 dB. I spotted him at negative 9 dB. So he was also probably operating um, very low power as well. So I'm able to talk from Kansas to Long Island, New York around about seven watts off of that antenna, that dipole antenna, that's only six feet off the ground. So that's absolutely incredible. That's not unheard of. Those that are listening to me talk about this and have operated FT8 and the other digital modes know that's absolutely normal. But if you're, if you're watching this and you're, and you're not uh, clued in on just how advanced amateur radio has become in in just the last three to five years I mean this this is what you need to be uh, looking at we're using radios that are being run by Arduinos we are using Raspberry Pis we are absolutely ahead of the times and a lot of that is thanks to most specifically Joe Taylor uh, that that has really hit the ground running with a lot of those digital modes and then you have folks like uh, Jordan Schur that has taken that open source digital mode code and adapted it. In this case, FT8 digital mode is uh, very scripted. You don't have the ability to do free text per se. That may change here with the WSJTX version 2.0. We'll see what happens. But with JS8 right now, I could write as much as I want. It's going to take a couple of iterations. In fact, 
how these modes work in particular FT8 and JS8 are these 15 second rounds in which you have to place your information out there but the reason why we can go so far and communicate so far on such low power is because you actually have to go very slowly so that's the one thing you have to understand about this communicate long distances very low power but you're looking at probably sending about 20 words per minute it's about as fast you're going to go with these modes and still be resilient to a lot of the noise that we face in HF so what I ran was VOACAP. This is VOACAP analysis, V-O-A-C-A-P. You can go to the website VOACAP.com. You can run these simulations where you put in the data. In this case, I'm using uh, JS8, but they don't have that updated yet. So put in FT8, so it knows it's using a digital mode. Put in about 10 watts, 8 to 10 watts of power, and then the frequency and then time of day because that absolutely is important and then it will let you know via color-coded scheme of the probability that you'll make contact with the station that's located in that region so really it needs to be a dark orange all the way to red in order to reliably communicate anything else uh, the the lighter orange on down to blue it's very difficult to make contact so what you see here with 14 megahertz is that the red dot in the very center of the US is where I am, surrounded immediately by a region of blue. And this is what's known as the skip zone. Now, does that mean I cannot ever talk to stations within that region? No, what I have to do is actually lower the frequency in the stations I'm communicate, communicating with need to lower their frequency so that we can actually communicate. So it's we create the skip zone if you will and that we virtually won't have a skip zone as long as we can plan accordingly depending on who we want to speak with and at what time of the day this just so happens to be for 2000 UTC so that's where I think I can pretty much talk if I wanted to now I'm going to show you a website this is pskreporter.info and a lot of us use this website to see who has observed us. There are hundreds of stations out there that they're not necessarily actually communicating, they're just monitoring. And in fact, some of these stations uh, may or may not be actual hams, but they're reporting this information just because they're monitoring, kind of like a scanner. I did not set, and I apologize for this, I did not set the filter to only show the stations that were listening for JS8 on 20 meters. So what you see is a bunch of balloons, different colors, meaning that those are stations listening on particular frequencies. And this this kind of will give a misconception of about who really did hear me and who didn't. But what this is showing is that generally the eastern seaboard and the western seaboard stations heard me. What I also was surprised about, look bottom right down there. You got Grand Cayman Island and then also Puerto Rico was two stations that heard me. And you can see where there's a balloon in yellow that says, let's say 65 minutes for instance. When I took the snapshot, that was the last time that station heard me. So after I operated, got back inside the house, got a good screenshot off the computer from this website of when they last heard me. Got all the way out to Vancouver, Ontario, up in Canada. So this all from, you see in the very center, the blue star, where I was operating from, JSA call. Now what I did was, I'm going to show you here in the next slide, superimposed the VOACAP analysis onto this just to show you how this works. Now, like I said, again, didn't filter out all the balloons. So what we're seeing is the stations that heard me were the ones that were, one, listening on 20 meters, and two, were listening for just JS8 call as the digital mode. JS8 and FT8 are, in, are not interoperable. So all those other balloons didn't hear me, probably because either they're not on the same frequency and they also weren't listening for JS8. Just want to make sure I got that out of the way. 
but by putting and superimposing the vocap analysis onto the pskreporter.info website, you can see that it, it validates it. The model is validated by what actually happened. And so this is just a neat experiment you can run where you can simulate where you think you're going to be able to talk, go out and operate, look it up and see who is out there that could potentially listen to you, and then show yourself or um, if you have kids or you're, you're running a scout program, you can show them how the model is, is validated by your actual experiment. Um, and again, is this a holistic view? Well, it all is dependent on the number of monitoring stations that are out there that are actually listening for that particular frequency in that digital mode. Um, but this, this is definitely very neat to show somebody that um, definitely right there in the center in the blue, nobody did hear me. Um, but even if they were listening for JS8 call, they probably weren't going to listen to me anyways because I was going to skip over them on 14 megahertz. You can see that if you wanted to talk to anybody on the eastern or western seaboards, that you're most likely going to be able to communicate with them. And here it is. It's, it's verified all along the eastern seaboard especially. Uh, one are obviously people that have updated a JS8 call. Uh, I was able to reach all the way out to Puerto Rico. And then, as a surprise, I didn't realize anybody in Grand Cayman was doing this, but they are, which is fantastic, and I had a great time. So this was very simple. It took probably about one hour's worth of operation and setup time to do what I just showed you. So I hope you can get out there and operate, whether it's JSA call, FT8, what have you. Um, and then on top of that, if you want to get into building radios, Microbitics has been a very popular uh, radio so far. There are a couple of complaints about it, such as it, it actually has um, harmonics that may be out of spec. Um, but people have been designing filter boards for that as well. Uh, there are some other quirks about it that can be repaired. But there's, there's some stuff online you can, you can search for. So I hope you found this useful. Again, like, subscribe, and look forward to the rest of the episodes on the Military HF series. Um, just about ready to go push out the episode on Military HF radio history, where I'll be talking really U.S.-centric uh, for now until I have a little bit more time to ensure I, get, I pay due diligence to the work that was done in the early part of the century by both uh, the Germans, Soviets, uh, the Australians, both then and, and recent, to make sure that I, I give a holistic view to the history of HF communications, because the U.S. has quite a bit to uh, thank the other countries that really got out ahead on technology, uh, in which we also were able to push technology um, to the limits as well. And I tell you, HF is just continuing to improve both technology and usage. Uh, for those that know that we're, we're still in a very uh, low part of the solar cycle, sunspot cycle, it is only improving. So things are just going to get a lot more fun for everybody. So take care. Have a great day.